So after all of these years, there's finally about to be closure. Before we get into today's video, I just wanna let you guys know that this video is for educational purposes only. Please remember to be kind to everybody everywhere in your everyday life, in your home, in the grocery store, and especially in the comment section down below. Please do not show hate to anybody anywhere. So good morning, good morning, good morning. How is everybody doing today? I hope you all are having an amazing day. I hope you all have had a wonderful week. I hope everybody enjoyed Spooky Week. If you did not catch the videos, I posted videos Monday through today being Friday all week long. And you know, I always say that the truth is scarier than fiction. And if you have not caught them, you should go back and watch those as well. But I thought how appropriate to wrap up Spooky Week with the Sarah Boone trial updates. And there was a lot that was revealed during this trial. Before we get into it though, I did wanna let you guys know if you don't already know, hi, my name is Christina. I do have a second channel, which is Casually Christina. We just do things way more casually over there. I also have a Patreon. My Patreon's for 18 and up. And over there, we talk about more personal stuff. We go live over there. And there's a $2 tier for all the true crime stuff that cannot go on to YouTube due to their terms and policies. That goes over on my Patreon under the $2 tier. Just make sure you read the full about section of what each tier offers before you join. I'm also on Instagram, Facebook, and Snapchat. And I'm on Like to Know It, and Like to Know It is a platform where you can find links to all of the things that I like and use and that y'all ask about, like this tree, matter of fact, is linked over there, uh, this chair, clothing items, makeup items, nail items, cooking utensils, gifts I buy for my husband and my kids and stuff like that that you guys ask about, I can link it all over there so it's one place where you can find those things. All of those platforms are linked down in the description box if you would like to come and check me out. So what I'm gonna do in today's video is I'm gonna go over highlights from the trial, kind of give you guys a little bit of a refresher, but as like a little spoiler, in this video, I'm gonna talk about some of the things, the highlights that happened in the trial. We're gonna talk about Sarah's testimony and where she was going with this. And by the way, if y'all do not know, they offered her a 15 year plea deal and she turned it down. I'm gonna tell y'all why I think she turned it down here in a minute as well. And we're gonna talk about the fact that her ex-husband testified, her neighbor testified, videos that was found on her phone of George. Now I thought his name was Jorge, but they kept calling him George during the trial. Since they called him George during the trial, we're gonna call him George Torres in today's video. And some of those videos, y'all, oh my gosh, we've got to get into those as well. And at the end of the video, we're gonna talk about what his family said because his daughters have since spoken out as well. And then at the end of the video, I'm gonna give y'all my opinion on what I think should happen. And there's, my opinion is probably gonna be sprinkled out throughout the whole video, but if you wanna know my opinion on what I think should actually happen, stay to the end of the video. So, all right, let's start with the background. After four years of waiting, the Sarah Boone trial, it finally just happened. And I mean, it went right on by. Now, part of the reason why it took four years, if y'all have not been following this with me, is because Sarah Boone went through nine attorneys before she found one that she liked. I have never in my, my 40 years of life seen anything like what Sarah Boone went through or put herself through because she had attorneys appointed by the courts. The previous eight attorneys withdrew from the case because of Sarah's behavior. And again, I ain't never seen nothing like that before. You can't get along with none of them attorneys. I mean, you got people that went on mass crime sprees that can keep an attorney. I mean, look at the BK situation, the Idaho Four. I mean, he's got a whole public defender team working for him right now. And Sarah could not keep an attorney. Nevertheless, specifically Sarah's sixth, seventh, and eighth attorneys went before the judge and described the difficult conditions that they endured while trying to speak with or defend Sarah Boone. They all told the judge that being Sarah's attorney was taxing every fiber of their bodies. The sixth attorney who represented Sarah from July of 2022 to September of 2023 withdrew after Sarah allegedly called him a dud and a buffoon. 
He claims that he put in an extensive 175 hours of hard work on her case. Sarah's seventh attorney, who represented her until February of this year, 2024, said that he too spent a lot of time on Sarah's case. He said that when he found an expert he wanted to use for the trial, Sarah told him no, simply because she did not like this like certain expert that he had found. He eventually told the judge that it was a constant back and forth battle between him and Sarah and that he just could not take it anymore. The eighth attorney said a lot of the same things, but she also said that her last straw was when Sarah wrote a 58 page letter to the judge to complain about her and her own access to evidence. You guys, again, this is a woman who is sitting in jail with video evidence of the crime that she's being accused of that's basically gone viral all over the internet, but obviously the courts have it as evidence. And she's going through these attorneys and talking to them like she's writing a check to them. I mean, it's absolutely mind boggling. Sarah actually brought this letter with her when she appeared in court on June 7th of this year, this 58th page letter. The letter itself included more than a dozen pages of legal definitions and bits and pieces of the Declaration of Independence, the Florida Rules of Criminal Procedure and the Florida Constitution. But most of the letter is Sarah just complaining about her eighth attorney. Sarah said that she had lost faith in her attorney and had even walked out of meetings with her. Like, can you imagine? Just like, we haven't even gotten to the trial yet. And when you think about the gall, is that the right word? Of this woman, it's like, tell me more about how the world revolves around you, sister. Like, let us all know so we can bow down or something. Not. She went on and on in this letter about how she was not being included and like about the internet and the increasing uh, mass infection and destruction of her hopes to have a fair trial and da 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 and all of this stuff. I mean, on one aspect, you can't blame a girl for trying. And on the other aspect, it's like, okay. So this attorney ended up withdrawing from Sarah's case a few days later. Because of all of this, the judge was just absolutely fed up. I mean, the the trial process is dragging, dragging, dragging. We're four years in at this point, and she cannot keep a public defender appointed to her. They keep withdrawing. So he was so, like, aggravated and was like, okay, this is done. Sarah has basically forfeited her right to a court-appointed attorney, and that if she did not want to represent herself, she was going to need to find her own lawyer. So Sarah put out a drawn ad, y'all. And this is the hand-drawn ad. And like, not gonna lie, a lot of us was chuckling like, okay, however, someone actually responded to it. Uh, well, you know, I watch uh, a lot of um, YouTube and uh, a lot of, I watch a lot of court TV and I was, I've been following this case uh, just like all the other true crime people do. And, um, you know, kept, kept watching it being delayed and the lawyers being switched and switched and switched. And then saw that um, the judge got fed up and ruled that she had forfeited her right to a court appointed counsel. And so that's a rare event. You know, um, as lawyers, we know that, you know, everybody has a right to a lawyer, a court appointed lawyer, if you can't afford one. So, um, on a serious charge, a felony, in this case it was a murder, uh, for the judge to revoke that right was, was a serious decision on his part. I, you know, I don't disagree. I respect the court's decision, but that left her um, facing a murder charge without a lawyer, which is unheard of, I think. And so the ad came out, and I, I sat there and waited for three or four weeks. I can't remember now how long I waited, but I was thinking that a lawyer out of Orlando would pick up the case. Nobody uh, responded in the local area. So I just happened to have a case down in Hillsborough County that I was going to, down in Tampa. Before that, I sent her a letter and she had a third party contact me to, I guess, check me out to see if I was legitimate. So anyway, she reached out to me and then a couple of days later, Sarah called me from the jail in Orange County in Orlando. And we talked for a little bit and I explained to her that I was coming down that Wednesday, but I'd come down early and spend Tuesday talking to her and she agreed. Now, this attorney shows up and the judge at this point 
Court was set to start on October 7th and the judge was not going to be putting it off anymore. And I will say that this attorney did an excellent job with what he was given. I mean, I was shocked. I was totally shocked walking, watching the trial. I was like, dang, this attorney is really trying. It's not changing my opinion if I was on the trial because I'm looking at the evidence here. But you could tell that the attorney really put in work and it could not have been an easy job. I mean, you guys, Sarah even requested to be able to eat snacks while the trial was ongoing, okay? So before the trial starts, she's like, judge, um, she requested to have her own snacks, her own drinks there. The judge was like, um, denied. Have y'all ever, ever in a murder trial seen what, what you want? Starbucks delivered to you, girlfriend? You want some hot and fresh and ready delivered to you at lunch? I mean, what would you like, Sarah, on your ninth attorney? And then she requested to have professional hair and makeup. And he gave her that request. I mean, y'all, we ain't even got to the trial yet. Now I want you to envision living in the same house with this person. Now, if you do not remember, I did a video on what Sarah Boone did about two years ago. So if you don't know about all that, you guys can go and catch up on that. But just as a brief reminder, on February 24th of 2020, Sarah's boyfriend, George Torres, was found deceased inside of a suitcase that was inside of him and Sarah's apartment. During multiple interviews with investigators, Sarah claimed that George had willingly got into the suitcase the night before when they were like playing hide and go seek. Sarah claimed that she forgot to let George out before she went upstairs and went to bed and fell asleep. So she said he got into the suitcase and she fell asleep and left him in the suitcase. The medical examiner officially ruled that George passed away from a positional asphyxiation, asphyxiation, I have struggled with that word, basically suffocating because of the position that he was in. Now, Sarah claimed over and over again that it was a complete accident. However, she had seemingly forgotten that she filmed George in the suitcase the night before, basically begging, not basically, definitely begging for his life while she taunted him and laughed at him. I'm not gonna place the video in here, but just the video is out there on the internet if you guys have not seen it. And they did play it in court, but what I'll tell you is he's in the, the suitcase and he's saying, Sarah, Sarah, and you could tell that he's kind of struggling to breathe. And she was saying things like, that's my name, don't wear it out. And he was like, Sarah, I can't breathe. And then she's like, well, that's how I feel when you choke me. Sarah, I can't breathe. That's how I feel when you choke me. Like, Sarah, please help me. Well, sorry, that's your problem, that type of thing. And But you could tell that he was really struggling and she forgot that she filmed him. Now, because of those videos, Sarah was arrested and she ended up being charged with George's murder. Now, just like I told y'all earlier, right before her trial, she was offered a 15 year plea deal, which I was so shocked when they offered her that because if she would have taken that, that would have been so, I think a misjustice, to be honest, if she would have gotten, she would, if she would have gotten that. But there's another little spoiler alert, I guess. However, Sarah with herself, she, she turned it down anyways. So now let's talk about some of the highlights from her trial. During opening statements, Sarah's defense team told the jury that they believed that Sarah suffered from battered spouse syndrome. The defense talked about they believed that zipping George into the suitcase was some sort of self-defense and they believed that it was justified. You were going to have doubts about this case. But the most important thing is not to rush to judgment, to keep an open mind and understand there's two sides to this case. There's their side and there's our side. So you can't form any fixed opinions early on. That's hard to do, as Mr. Henderson said in opening or in jury so much. That's extremely hard to do. Now you're going to hear some testimony has been mentioned by experts. Battered women's experiences affect her perception of imminent danger. Battered women's experiences affect her perception of imminent danger. Victims of repeat violence may fear death 
in a situation others would not. Now, Sarah's 911 phone call was played and body cam footage was shown for when the officers first responded to her house. Is this a police so call? My boyfriend is dead. you let me set the tone because when I was watching her talk about this I was like am I in a twilight zone because the two of them were in their 40s okay sorry but I'm just gonna say it like it is they were in their 40s they're living in this like apartment duplex type of thing neither one of them got a job at this point and both of them drink like a fish okay they drink all day every day basically is what it seems like from Sarah now of course Sarah kind of makes it seem like he was the one that drank the most and she didn't but nevertheless so on this day Sarah says that they are 
drinking, they're having wine, they're going outside on the back porch talking, smoking their cigarettes, they come inside, they're painting. She talks about how her ex-husband, who, mind you, has her child, okay, because they have a, she has a son with her ex-husband, and that he keeps calling her, but that her ex-husband knows that when she doesn't answer, it's because she's busy, because she's probably online looking for a job or something. I'm listening to this woman say, you mean to tell me you're 40-something years old, he's got your kid, you sitting at home with your boyfriend getting drunk, painting, and playing games, she said, and then later going to play hide-and-go-seek, and you can't even answer the phone to your ex-husband who has your child like this is some sort of twilight zone but nevertheless she makes it seem like they had this wonderful evening playing these games and drinking and 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 all of that now sarah never actually admitted to being like drunk but she had to have been somewhat drunk because she did not remember taking this video of George in the suitcase and she willingly turned her phone over to the police the next day. Now Sarah's police interrogation footage was uh, shown in court as well and Sarah tries to tell the same story that she did at the scene until the investigators told her that they watched the videos of her on her phone. They even played them for Sarah during the interrogation. No, it's just the way you said it. You guys you are like, scaring me. Bye. Well, we just want you to watch this. This came from your phone. Don't you want to know what's on it? Yes, please. <laughs> Is it long? Because I don't know how much I can take. Mm -mm. No. I don't know how much I can take. I don't know how to find her. <laughs> Do I have to watch this? I continuously throw up. I don't sleep. I don't want to see it, if that's okay. <clears throat> well, it's on your phone. And you can either explain it or we take it for what it is. Yeah. We're just trying to give you the opportunity to tell us what's going on. That's it. It's that long? Two minutes. No, For everything you've done to me. <coughs> For everything you've done to me. Oh. you. Oh. That's you, Sarah. your voice. <laughs> Stupid. Sarah. That's my name. Don't wear it up. Last time we talked to you, you had said that you put him in the suitcase, he had two fingers hanging out, and you I went to bed. I flipped him over. I flipped him over, and that's but, where it was. I mean, there's two different Funny. videos and a still picture where, yeah, it shows you flipping him in different positions, and him saying that he can't breathe, and you saying This is upside down. So, in order for him to have gotten into it, it was flipped up. Right. It was flipped up normal. Yes. Like, as if you're packing something. So this is upside down. Guys, this is killing me right now. So this image is upside down, and then this small video that occurred 11 minutes later, it's flipped over the other way, closer to your dining room table. Okay. Now, he's obviously still in there. So he didn't, how did that, how did it go from the back to the front? I flipped it. My plan was not to go upstairs and go to sleep. Well, that's what you did. Yeah. But not intentional love. No, you told me you went upstairs because what? you were getting ready for bed. Stop here. Okay, but here? show me where you can see any fingers coming out because there's the end. It's And his head's right here. Mm -hmm. So going like this, rather than going all the way up, it's like this. But why is he saying I can't breathe, and why is he pushing on it as if he can't get out? And it doesn't it's, show a hole. You, there's no hole. There's no fingers. I don't see his fingers. There's no hole. 
I don't know what you want me to tell you. Like, I don't know, like, what you want me to tell you. I'm just showing you, I'm just telling you what we see and what we've heard from the other I understand. Video. I understand. He's begging to let, for you to let him out. You sound, you're laughing in the beginning and then in the end it sounds kind of like a no. It's not malicious. Now, Sarah's ex-husband, Brian Boone, got up to testify, and he spoke about the custody agreement that they had between the two of them. He talked about how Sarah was supposed to have their son for five days a week, and he would have them for five days a week, and they were supposed to be alternating. However, he had to call her to see if she would be picking him up from school and stuff like that. And so... What I got out of it from my very unprofessional opinion is she was so irresponsible that this man is constantly calling her like, hey, it's Monday. He gets out of school at three o'clock. Are you going to be picking him up from school? Or don't forget tomorrow. You've got to get him from school. She's at home painting, getting tore up basically. Well, never mind. She says she didn't get tore up. Drinking wine and painting and playing board games and hide and go seek with her boyfriend and he's kind of like, it was just so sad to like really think about the dynamic of what was going on here. And in February of 2020, um, did you have, uh, do you recall the events that occurred, I guess, first on the, the late evening of February 23rd, 2020? Um, on that evening? Yes. Uh, uh, well, apparently, uh, Sarah called me at one point during the night. Do you recall about what time she called you? I think it was 11-something. When you answered the phone, how did Sarah sound on the phone? She sounded like she had been drinking and was pretty drunk. Were you able to understand what the defendant was saying? Um, somewhat, but she woke me up. I had work the next day. I was asleep when she called. Um, she's done this before calling me late at night and generally I kind of just try to ignore it. So I wasn't really paying attention. Um, who was she living with at the time? Uh, George Torres. When she called you late that evening, uh, could you hear George in the background at all? N not that I remember. No. Did you pay much attention to this phone call? No. Now, the following morning, on February 24th, 2020, did you begin to call the defendant? Yes, I did. And Pleasure. approximately what time did you begin to call the defendant? Um, I think it was like 11 o'clock or something. And why was it that you were calling her? Um, well, it was going to be Monday. Um, I had had him on Sunday and dropped him off at school, and I was calling to try and find out if she was going to be actually picking him up that day. Why would you have a question about whether or not she was picking him up? She wasn't generally very good about actually getting him on the day she was supposed to. So it was not uncommon for you to have to remind her uh, to pick him up or to make sure that she she was going to pick him up? Well, I mean, remind or just find out if she was going to or if she was just going to give him over to me as what happened. However, when she woke up the next morning and realized that George was passed away, she called her ex-husband before she called the police. And he's the one that told her, you need to call 911, you need to call 911. And he's the one that ended up coming over that you would see on the body cam footage later. Now, while the prosecution was still presenting their case, this is when the neighbor testified to hearing like this loud banging the night before. And the neighbors would talk about how they would always hear yelling and fighting coming from that apartment, that duplex? Would uh, apartment complex, um, how would you describe uh, the walls that separated your units? Thin, like very thin walls. And with those walls being so thin, uh, would you ever have occasion to hear uh, arguing and yelling coming from 
Sarah, Sarah Boone in George Torres's apartment. Yeah. yeah. How often would you hear this? Almost daily. Did, did Sarah Boone ever approach you about the things that you heard coming from their apartment? Yes. And where were you when she approached you? I was smoking a cigarette on my back patio. And approximately what time it was, was this? Pretty late. I can't remember the exact time, but it was definitely anywhere between like midnight to 2 a.m., like right around there. And do you remember how uh, how much before uh, the date when the police called that this occurred? Uh, a few months, like it, probably four to five months before that. So four or five months before February. Of 2020. 2020. Yeah. yeah. And when she approached you on this late evening slash early morning on that day, what did she tell you? Pretty much just kind of like, if if I do hear anything, like through the walls or whatever, as out back, just kind of keep my mouth shut. Like, don't really speak about it or anything like that or say anything to anyone. And I just was like, okay. Did she make any motions with her hands? Yeah, like, just kind of, like, you know, finger over the lips, like, kind of, shh, like, keep it hushed, like, that kind of thing. So she told you not to report anything you yeah. may have heard about arguments or yelling or fighting, anything going on over there? Yeah. And then on day three of the trial, Sarah took the stand in her own defense. And again, Sarah got up there and told the same story as before about them playing hide and go seek and all that stuff. But this time, she also said that she was basically too scared to let George out of the suitcase. She also admitted to hitting George's hand with a bat when he stuck it out of the suitcase when he was trying to get out. I saw, I looked over and I saw him settling himself in the suitcase. What did you do? In my head, I said, oh man, um, we're obviously not going to be going to sleep anytime soon. You got up to him, did he see you? Yes. All right, tell us what happened. Um, I, I mean, I just kind of, I zipped him up. We thought it was funny and um, we're joking about how he was I guess small enough to fit inside of the suitcase. Did you eventually close the top? Yes, in order for, well, the top was already closed. As he was settling himself in there, it was, that's how I knew he was in there was because the top was kind of flopping a little bit. Okay. So he had gotten in there to hide and he pulled the top. Yes. On top of it, but you could tell he was in there. Yes. You saw him right away. Yes. All right. So at some point, did you zip him up? Did yes. You and what was he saying or doing when you were zipping him up? I just thought it was funny. Um, were you both laughing? Mm -hmm. Yes. Went over and decided to um, videotape to just see the, um, I guess, the, the jest in it for him to understand that right now I feel safe and right now I have the ability to actually speak to you. Um, in a manner that normally I would not have the ability to do. Um, and you were intoxicated. Yes. And you would agree that you said some things you should not have. Yes. But you, you realized he could not get out and get at you. Is that fair? At that moment, yes. I want you all to know that I, the majority of the time, am always afraid and always scared. All right. Well, I understand that. Okay, I understand that. But um, would it be fair to say that you had some anger at that point? I did. And I. Would it be fair to say that you wanted to tell him off to some degree? I just wanted, yes, for him to have a better understanding, um, which was the whole point of the videos and documentation prior. His hand started to come through. His his hand started to come through this way. And so I shook the suitcase. I shook the suitcase trying to get his hand to go back in, shaking it. 
and telling him that, please stop doing this. Please, please stop doing this to me. Please stop doing this to me. So his hand, his hand actually got out of the suitcase. Yes. And you went to the suitcase. Yes. And shook it. Yes. Did that force his hand to go back in? No. Um, so you're shaking it. Were you shaking it to try to get the suitcase, his yes. hand back in? Yes. How long did you shake it? I don't know. But his hand was still out? Yes. Was he trying to get out? Forcefully, yes. Was he angry at you? Yes. Were you in fear? Always. What second reaction that I had, I happened to see that and I grabbed the baseball bat and was trying to poke his hand to go back in to please don't go, don't break through, please. So I hit his hand. You said you poked him with it? Yes, I, I kind of pushed, um, like I held it with the skinny part here and then. So the, so the grip here. Brought it at it, yes. You grabbed, you, you grabbed it with both hands here. Yes. And then the barrel of the bat, the big part of the bat is here. Correct. And you thrusted it in, into the s different areas of the suitcase? I started with his hand and his hand, he was still trying to get out. He was still trying to do that. So I started to push on the suitcase around it, hoping to have his hand retract and go back inside. You made those injuries. I did. We've seen the photographs. Yes. We see the, the bruising. Is that from that bat? Yes. Eventually, did his hand go back inside from you doing? Yes, finally he had, had subsided and retracted his hand. So in your mind, did you prevent him from attacking you? Absolutely. Now in her defense, and this is the part of the trial that disturbed me the most, you guys. When Sarah Boone was talking to the investigators years ago, when we first saw the footage of her being interviewed slash interrogated, when they told her that they had the video of that of the suitcase on the phone, she was talking about, did you see all the other stuff that she, she was like, did you see all the other videos that I had on the phone? And they were like, yes. It really made it seem to me or a lot of the public, that she had a lot of videos of him being abusive to her and she did have photos and there was this photo right here that was posted of her in court with a black eye that she said that George gave her. And so this whole time I'm like, yeah, she, she did this, but he also did these things too. And so this would seem like a very toxic relationship, which mind you, I do believe that it was. But when you seen the videos in court that she had on her phone of George, I'm not going to lie, they were so sad. And I'm going to tell y'all straight up, in no disrespect to his family at all, I'm sure that they know this, and I don't know what he was like before this. I know what his daughter said. His daughter said that he was their best friend. They loved his dad very much. I heard his ex-wife do an interview and say that, yeah, they had arguments. She said that he was like a ladies' man, but he was never use of in the way that she says that he was. So I want to say that, but the videos that I saw, the man was a like 105 pounds, a grown man. He was bones. He looked emaciated. He was so skinny. And sh their videos on there was her taunting him. To me, the way that I received it is she was filming him and he would be drunk and she would be taunting him. Check out this video right here where he's in the hallway, obviously passed out. I want to go sleep. Go downstairs. Okay, yeah. I know. I'm leaving you, and I'm going to try and cancel plane tickets. No. Because I don't do special things for people like you that are doing this. Like, to me, after I asked you, at 1.21 in the morning, I wanted to be asleep. I wanted to stay asleep, which is why I got in the bed at 8.30. I told you not to step foot in the bedroom. So what do you do? Nonetheless, you're drunk. I the amount I of alcohol, I know how much was up. I know I how much was there. Drunk. That's why you're, I could smell you in the bed before you actually got me up. I can smell 
smell you from here. You're despicable. How am I despicable? I'm not even doing anything. Leave me alone. Okay. You're not gonna remember shit. Okay. Yeah, okay. Well, I'm not doing nothing right now. Get away from me. Get away from me. You do everything to me all the time. All the time. Heartache and pain is what you cause me. Heartache and pain. How is that? Then there was another video that she had on her phone of him hitting the television with a baseball bat. Now, this was her saying, like, look at how aggressive he is. He beat my, my television with a baseball bat. But I don't know, you guys. When I watched it, I thought... This is a very interesting dynamic. This man is struggling to swing the bat. I mean, he has to stop and <gasps> take, br take breaths. And she's filming it and not saying anything. It's almost like she told him to do this and she would film it. And she saved that video for a time she would need it. Y'all watch the video and tell me what y'all think. You're going to help me take it out. You're gonna help me take this out. Now, mind you, there was also a photo that was added in court of him passed out on the couch with that bat afterwards. It's like just him swinging that bat wore him completely out. And I don't know, I just did not receive it in the way I feel like she was putting it out there to be received. I'm like, there's something, there's something weird about the, these interactions. And it really gave me, she was setting him up type of vibes or something. It, it's very disturbing. When you saw those videos, and like I'm gonna show y'all one right here where he's in the back of a cop car and he's telling the officer that she hits him all the time. Hey, all the time. Who hit him first? She does all the time. So she hits him first? All the time. And when you see all those videos, and then you see the one of him in the suitcase begging for his life, I don't know, y'all. It was very unsettling to see. So clearly the two of them had a toxic relationship, and neither one of them were perfect. However, I find it very interesting how very domineering that Sarah is in basically all all of the footage shown. I mean, there's even text messages where she ripped up his birth certificate and sent him photos that it was like antagonistic, if you ask me. It's like she was trying to upset him and, hi and hide her hands. I it's very disturbing, you guys. I mean, in one video, Sarah allegedly has uh, George read off some statements that he's supposed to give to the judge to hopefully get charges that was against Sarah dropped. I'm gonna go to court and I'm gonna tell the judge, listen, my fiance has nothing to do with it. It's all my fault. We were both drinking and got out of hand. Isolated situation it has never happened before. I love my fiance. She's a good woman. Never been in trouble in her life. She has a seven year old son that she loves and cherishes. A blind box interior. She has two dogs. One is blind, one is deaf. She goes around and she's driving and sees a, an animal that's injured. She'll stop in the middle of the street, no matter what kind of traffic it is, just to make sure that that animal doesn't get injured any more than where it already has. We both love each other, we both live together. 
yes, every relationship has their arguments. But we are not the type of people that you guys are portraying us to be. She especially. Especially her. So please, if you can, dismiss, dismiss this case, Close. drop it. She is not the type of person. Good person. Great person. Angel. I know she'd be an angel. <coughs> She's close to it. Best thing that has ever happened to you. Yes, ma'am. I love you to death. And I hate that we're going through this. Then in the closing arguments, uh, they were very interesting as well, in my opinion, especially the prosecution. There was a moment when they brought out the suitcase that I thought was pretty telling. The testimony from the defendant is George Torres' head is here. You can stand if you need. You've been sitting a long time too. His head is here. His butt is kind of down here, his feet are here, and his hands and his knees are up here. He's in the fetal position, if we remember right. The hematoma on his head is on the left side. The bruises, the deep bruises on his back are on his left side. That's, you hear that? That's solid. You don't have to accept that she put those marks on him when he was in there. The evidence doesn't support it. You can conclude she used this bat when he was outside the suitcase. You don't have to believe her when she said they were playing hide and seek. You don't have to believe her because she doesn't know the rules. She came downstairs, saw what she had done, and had all the opportunity in the world to clean up whatever mess may have been at the bottom of the stairs. But ladies and gentlemen, physics doesn't lie. She can't expect you to believe her testimony about the loud boom being the day before compared to her two neighbors who weren't drinking, who have no interest in the outcome of the case, who suffer from none of the infirmities of her testimony. She suffers from all six infirmities. When her neighbors say there was a loud boom that night, there was a loud boom that night. Did it shake the wall they shared in common? It shook the wall that they shared in common. Did she have any injuries consistent with being dragged up and down the stairs the night before? No, you saw the pictures the CSI took. You don't have to accept her story about hide and seek. Something made that loud boom. It takes energy to make a loud boom. Energy that could very well be in the form of somebody going down some of the stairs, all the stairs, in the suitcase, out of the suitcase. But that's what the evidence supports is there was a loud boom that shook the walls and interrupted a FaceTime conversation that was so loud that the girlfriend on the other end heard it. Something loud happened. And then there was silence, according to the witnesses. And again, with everything, I really feel like the defense brought one heck of a defense for what they were given. I mean, you have the suitcase and you've got this woman who's obviously can't get along with anybody and unless she has them closed off from their family and drunk all day every day, allegedly. So the defense did a great job for what they were given to work with. But when it was all said and done, there was a six person jury and they were sent out for deliberations. And y'all, in just an hour and a half later, they came back with a verdict of guilty for second degree murder. Madam Clerk, if you could please publish the verdict. In the circuit court of the Ninth Judicial Circuit and in Orange County, Florida, case number 2020 CF2603. The state of Florida versus Sarah Boone. Verdict. We, the jury, find the defendant guilty of murder in the second degree as charged in the information. So say we all, dated at Orlando, Orange County, Florida, on this 25th day of October 2024. The form has been signed by the four persons. Madam Clerk, please poll our jury. Jury 
you're in seat number one, is this your true and correct verdict? Yes, it is. You're in seat number two, is this your true and correct verdict? Yes, it is. You're in seat number three, is this your true yes, and correct verdict? You're in seat number four, is this your true and correct verdict? Yes. You're in seat number five, is this your true and correct verdict? Yes. You're in seat number six, is this your true and correct verdict? Yes, ma'am. And a reminder that they offered her 15 years. And she turned it down. It's so typical for her personality now that we know like a, a more full picture. I mean, when you saw the videos of her trying to control the situation in the interview and when she was even talking to the cops when they showed up to her house and then you think about all the attorneys that she went through and then you think about her asking for snacks and, and, and professional hair and makeup and just all of this stuff. And then she turned down a 50. It's like this woman had been controlling everybody in her life for so long that she thought she was going to control the whole entire court system too. But they came back with a guilty verdict. Now, George's daughters, like I said earlier in the video, they spoke with court TV and one of his daughters very clearly said that Sarah Boone is extremely calculating, very manipulative. And she said that her father was the real victim. Media is stating she is a victim or um, a gentle individual. I'm sure she's loved over there at jail due to the fact that Sarah Boone is very, very calculated. Um, she by no means is a kind and sweet, soft-spoken woman. She is very calculated, very devious, very conniving. Um, my father was sheltered and berated. He was kept from us. He was the real victim in this situation. Um, unfortunately, again, as stated, he is not here to tell his story but we are here to give his side the best we can from the view that we were able to see things. And it's very interesting because Sarah Boone claimed that George's family did not like her, which if that was my father, it'd be very hard to like you too with all of that stuff going on. And y'all can imagine, this is the things that we are seeing with her on her best behavior. These are videos that we have seen with her in front of the police, in front of investigators, dealing with the court system that she's not paying a dime for, the, dealing with her ex-husband who's taking care of her son, and then she gets up in court and says that basically he's bugging her by calling her and interrupting her while she's sitting in the apartment getting drunk and playing games and painting, and he's taking care of her son, and she talks about him like that. So it's like, I could understand probably why his family wasn't too fond of her, but in the interview, they said, yes, yeah, that's about the only thing she was honest about is um, we did not like her because they believed that she was evil. And I'll tell y'all that I agree with them. Sarah Boone will be sentenced on December 2nd of this year, and you better believe she's going to try to get every appeal and exhaust every appeal that she can. However, uh, she faces 20 years to life in prison. And again, she turned down 15. And if you want to know my opinion, I think she's very dangerous. Very, very dangerous for multiple reasons. The amount of manipulation, I hope that she gets the max. I do. She She's dangerous in my opinion. Unprofessional, I don't know her, but from what I see. And I've said this before. I mean, right is right and wrong is wrong. It's one thing when a person makes an impulsive decision in a heated moment or a crime of passion or whatever, right? But justice still needs to be served. It's another thing when a person is constantly calculated, when they think things through day in, day out, they plan, they take videos, they set a person up. Those types of people scare me, to be honest. Like that is is a dangerous person. The person that can smile in your face and get up there on a stand and act all, yeah, we were having a great night. It was wonderful. And then turn around and film a man while he is struggling to breathe. And then goes upstairs with her wine and goes to sleep. Like, <sighs> to wrap this up, I'm going to tell y'all a conversation that I had with my husband after watching this trial. 
it really makes me nervous seeing those videos with George. And again, like I said, I'm sure he wasn't perfect. He had his ways about him too, right? But are we living in a world now that we have to actually prepare our children that people will set them up? Especially boys, those of us that are boy moms that have sons because they don't think like that most of the time. They don't think ahead. When I used to do prison videos years ago, people used to always ask me what prisons were worse, the males or the females. And I always said they were both bad. And the reason why I believe that, the males, they fought a lot. I mean, it was just on site, whatever happens, gangs, all of that type of stuff. But the women were calculated. They thought 10 steps ahead of the game. They thought how to take their time and get you. And I told the story about the, one, the women that put all the mayonnaise in a bowl and microwaved it and it became like an oil or a grease and threw it in this, this other woman's face. And literally her face turned completely white because the skin came off and she had to be life flighted out of there. I mean, it's two totally different ball games with the way that the different between the males and the females act. And these, these videos, these videos of George, it makes me wonder, are we living in a world that we literally have to teach and prepare our children or our sons that you could be being set up all times at any time? It's kind of scary when you think about it. Y'all let me know what y'all think in the comment section down below. Other than that, I love you guys. Thank y'all for watching. And what do y'all think? Do you hope she gets 20 years? Do you hope she gets more? Let me know what you think in the comment section down below. And I'll see y'all in the next video. Love you guys. Bye.